My presentation of Molly Peck. So she is going to do this museum today about beneficial insects. And Molly is a board certified entomologist. She is the senior program specialist in um, Bexar County. She lives in San Antonio. Um, uh, she's the, the specialist in integrated pest management. Okay, with agri-life. So let's welcome Molly. Uh, so my name's Molly Keck. I am a um, program specialist and entomologist with um, uh, the AgriLife Extension Service, and I'm located in San Antonio in Bear County. So um, I'm going to talk today about um, some of the beneficial insects that are out there. Um, I'm an entomologist, so I enjoy insects. I know that a lot of people maybe don't enjoy them because they do some damage to your plants, they can do some damage to your home, that kind of thing. My background is really in urban and structural entomology and landscape entomology, so not row crops as much, but things that maybe might be in your veggie garden or on your trees or on your flowers and then those inside of your home. Um, and I think most people are surprised to know that most insects are beneficial. Um, we as a culture have decided that they're all nasty and gross and scary maybe, but in reality, less than 5% of the millions of species and millions probably more unnamed species are actually harmful. And if you are a beneficial insect, um, so there's beneficial and there's neutral insects. So a lot of them are out there that don't do really anything good or bad, but they're part of the ecosystem in some way. But if you're a beneficial insect, you fall under one of three really broad categories. You're either a predator, um, a pollinator, or you're some sort of a decomposer. And a parasitoid is a little bit different than a predator. We'll talk about those, but I guess you could kind of clump them together and call these the, the, um, the carnivores of the insect world. So uh, predators and parasitoid, parasitoids are a little different. A predator is like a mountain lion. It's something that's larger than its prey generally. So it takes it down, it consumes it completely, and it kills it almost immediately. Whereas a parasitoid is usually smaller than its prey, and it utilizes another um, thing as a host. And it has to keep that host alive so that it's able to complete its life cycle. So it will live inside instead of eating it from the outside. Eventually it will kill the prey, but it keeps it alive just long enough that it makes it through its life cycle. And when you're infested with something um, that's really big and gross, then you probably are not going to eat. You're not going to mate. You're not going to do all the bad things that we maybe don't want those insects out there doing. So there's a handful of parasitoids. And if y'all are um, into sci-fi stuff, then um, do some Googling about parasitoids because it's really pretty bizarre and wild what nature has figured out. So um, this is a little tiny wasp. And if you guys grow milkweed, uh, basically, if you grow any plants at all, you've seen aphids before. They're probably the most number one common sap sucking insect that are on our plants. And so you know that aphids are incredibly tiny. And when an, when this little parasitoid will lay its egg into an aphid, it is about the size of that aphid. So it's not very large. If there were a million of them flying around in your garden, you wouldn't even know they were there. And it will um, develop inside of the aphid. They become mummified. So you see them kind of fat right there on the right-hand side. They'll eventually cut a hole and make a, and make a little cap so that they can climb their way back out after they've gone through the egg, the larva, feeding on it from the inside, using that body as a pupa capsule, and then coming out as an adult to do it all over again. And I think I have a video here. With all this cool, wet weather, plants in oh, my I garden warn you. just... The guy has a funny voice, um, but he's, I don't know how to take, well, actually, I'm going to take it off so we don't have to hear him because he's probably kind of annoying. But so there is, uh, there's a bunch of aphids here and you see some kind of fat ones, little round things. Those are mummified aphids. And in a second, if I pick the right video, there is our aphid parasitoid. And it's going to come along and lay its egg in an aphid here in a second. Maybe we do wanna hear what he has to say. There it goes. 
So the aphid doesn't like it. It's going to kind of kick its legs. It's kind of um, the wasp is kind of testing that aphid out to see if it um, can get it in the right position. It's kind of funny to see an aphid kick like a dog or something or a person. And there she goes. She's pointing her abdomen, trying to find the right spot. She did it in his eye right there is what it looked like. I don't think that's where they actually lay their eggs. And so one egg <laughs> per one jumping aphid. And I don't know how many she lays at one time. Most insects will lay up to 30. So one, one wasp, let's say, can control 30 aphids for you. But those aphids are not reproducing too. So if you have any, when it, when it starts to warm up, um, y'all are probably already, well, no, it's pretty cold out there. Um, when it starts to warm up and the plants start to get aphids on them, take a look because I bet you, you'll see some mummified aphids on some of those plants. Another type of parasitoid that's pretty cool is a braconid wasp. And these, you've probably seen this on some caterpillars. And if you do, you wanna not kill that caterpillar, leave it alone. This little tiny wasp will lay its eggs inside of caterpillars and does a good job of doing it on our tomato hornworms, which we don't like to have um, chewing up our tomatoes. And so what you see is not actually the eggs. Those are the pupa cases. So all these eggs, 30 plus eggs, have been laid inside of this caterpillar. They are eating that caterpillar from the inside out. Caterpillar's not feeling good. It's not eating, it's not developing, it's not growing, going through its life stages. They will then, when they're ready to become a pupa, they'll bust through the skin and make those pupa cases. So if you see a wasp, I mean, a, a caterpillar like this, leave it alone because if you kill it, you might kill these pupa and you want more of these to come out to help control the, the caterpillar population that, that um, is maybe in your garden or even up in the trees. And I know some people are saying, well, caterpillars are good for, um, lizards and for birds. And, and while that's true, nature's not always nice. There has to be an ebb and a balance. And this is part of that ebb and balance. Um, and if we didn't have our predators controlling these guys or our parasitoids, keeping them in check, then we wouldn't have a whole lot of plant material. Things would go, go way haywire. Um, so I, I always leave it alone, even if it's a beneficial um, uh, butterfly going to turn into something good because it's part of the grand scheme of living things. And then you've probably heard of this little wasp. A lot of these parasitoids are very host specific to the type of um, insect or egg that they're attracted to, whether it be beetles, caterpillars, um, specifically eggs of caterpillars. So trichogramma wasps, which had its heyday back not too long ago where everybody was purchasing them and releasing them. And you notice we don't hear anything about them so much anymore. And that's really because we found out that if they're there, they're just going to be there. And if we release more of them, if the environment was not suitable for them that year, then those are going to die too. So you will, they are naturally there. They don't really need to be um, uh, expanded upon that by us releasing them, but they're known to lay their eggs in the, e the eggs of caterpillars. And then they feed on that caterpillar as it's developing. So those are some parasitoids. There's also a billion others that can be pretty wild. Um, one that's really fun to look up is the decapitating forid fly for fire ants. That's got some cool videos um, that's trying to you know, be released. Several species have been released now, but trying to help kind of keep the fire ant populations low in certain parts of the state. So we, we also have our predators. Predators are going to eat things that are a little bit smaller than them. Their size are smaller. So these predators are not going to take us down. They're not going to, they're not going to be able to consume us. So there's no reason to really be worried about them. And sometimes they can be really cute things like ladybugs or lady beetles. I throw this in here because I think everybody knows what a lady beetle looks like. They're either red with some black spots. Sometimes they're black with red spots. Maybe they're a little orange in color. There's one species that's actually gray with black spots, but I don't think that's a super common one. I've personally never seen it in the wild, um, but it's out there. But I think what people don't realize is their eggs are kind of this golden color. And so if you see those on a plant, while I'm sure there are other insects that have this color egg, I leave it alone because I assume it's a ladybug. And their larvae, everybody doesn't realize what their larvae look like. To me, they're like alligator tails. Um, they look kind of ferocious. And if they look ferocious, then they're ferocious. Leave them alone. They're doing something good. 
Um, but those little ladybugs consume a whole lot of aphids and other small insects. And oftentimes when you see bad bugs on your plant, if you are calm enough to take a step back and really do some inspecting and see if you find an adult or you find the eggs or you find that larvae or maybe the pupa, give it a couple of days. Oftentimes they will bring that population low enough that it's not a concern necessarily or that, that it keeps the plant from the plant continues to do what you want it to do. It's just maybe aesthetically you see some bugs on it. Well, if you can handle that, then the, let the plant do its own thing and let these natural enemies um, help keep them in check. And there's lots of species of, of lady beetles. Um, you often hear about the Asian lady beetle, which was a USDA project to release a natural enemy to control a specific pest that was a big problem. And um, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have these out in the springtime right now. These are out there and they're, they're eating and they're um, eating all the bad bugs for us. It's just they do a weird thing in the wintertime where they like to get hunkered up maybe in the eaves of your house, up in the soffits or your attic. And they can, I don't know, if you've ever held a ladybug, they have a really musty smell to them. And when that smell gets out, it can be kind of annoying or just having a bunch of bugs in your house isn't always nice. In Texas, we're kind of used to it. In other parts of the world where they have really true winters um, for long, long periods of time where it doesn't warm up, they these guys can become a problem. But um, Asian, if you hear about this, you know, horrible Asian lady beetle, don't worry about it. They're, they're still out there doing good things in the spring. They just do a weird thing in the winter time, but they're not harmful. Lace wings are out and about right now. Once it warms up, if you've got a nice warm evening, leave your porch lights on at night. If you uh, go outside and you kind of knock some foliage around, you'll see them floating. Lace wings are a, um, we call them garden fairies in our office because that when they fly, they're not real zippy. They're just kind of like a fairy. They just kind of float and fall and float and fall. Uh, real easy to catch and snatch out of the air. They are so ferocious that the mother will lay her eggs on these stalks. And you've probably seen this on door frames, your mailbox, a piece of patio furniture, a plant. They lay it wherever they want to. They don't care where it's laid. And they lay them on stalks because if they laid them flat on a, on a leaf, the first one that hatched would eat all of its brothers and sisters because they're all hatching at about the same time. So by being up high, they're concerned with getting down and away instead of noticing all the other ones jiggling their way out and then they consume them. So these little larvae are really, really ferocious. You don't often see them. I, you very rarely will notice an, a pupa case, but you will see the adults and you will see the eggs. So you see evidence that you have these great predators in that larval form. Um, and they're, they're of all the predators, they're probably my favorite because they're just so numerous and they're just so interesting. The story about that, that egg is just kind of bizarre. And then, of course, there's lots of assassin bugs, tons of species of assassin bugs, and nature is not always nice. This is an assassin bug inside of a prickly pear cactus that's grabbed a sweat bee. So, you know, they don't have brains like we do. They don't know to only kill the things that we don't want them to do, but this is what nature is. This is part of nature. You might love deer, but you also know that it has to be food for mountain lions and for, um, you know, other large predators. It's just, it's just kind of part of it. So nature's not always nice. It's, it's really interesting though, when things do start to bloom, look inside of those big, bold flowers and you will, you'll see a lot of stuff happening inside there. We know, you know, it's an assassin bug though, if you see how short the mouth part is. Our, our sap sucking bugs, so these are related to stink bugs. The sap suckers have a really long mouth part, but also assassin bugs have very skinny heads. They are predators. So they have to be able to turn and seek out their prey. Whereas sap suckers have a, just a fat head. They, you almost can't tell the head from the rest of the body because their food is so large. They don't really have to be looking around for it. So real, my kind of differentiating um, characteristic to know if it's a good guy or a bad guy, even in a pretty crummy picture, is looking at that skinny head versus a real fat kind of webbed neck that goes right into the shoulders. Then there's praying mantises. Um, I don't care who you are, you see a praying mantis, you kind of get excited when you see them in your garden. They are not, they don't care what they feed on either. So they often will feed on each other or butterflies or hummingbirds or other beneficial insects. Um, they are opportunistic. They take, they go after whatever they want to. And if you purchase praying mantises and release them, you usually purchase the egg cases. 
they lay an oatheca or an egg case and out of that will come 30 or so really cute adorable little praying mantises that will scatter around um, and they they spread so when you purchase those from the nursery they don't usually stick around in your garden they they will go to all your neighbors and everywhere else but that's what they do they get away from where they were born to go seek out their food so if you want them give them to your neighbors and hope that they move into your yard and then we just have tons of other predators. There's lots of wasps that are predatory. Um, paper wasps are eating caterpillars and other things. Um, they do sting you. So, you know, if you have an allergy or they're in a spot where they're a threat to you, I think human life and comfort is more important than these wasps. And so kill them because there's more in other places. And um, especially if there's a, an allergy to them, then that's a significant enough reason to not even care that you knocked them down and that you killed them. We've got uh, true yellow jackets, which are really nasty. I don't know if you guys have as many out in El Paso, but they tend to nest in the ground, make voids in the ground up against trees. They can really be anywhere. Super aggressive though, very large colonies, never go away even in the summer, in the, in the winter time, they never die off. And so the colonies are, you know, 60,000 plus wasps that will all come out and sting you. So with, in those, in that case, I always recommend that you get rid of them. But then, you know, there's those that are not that harmful, like the little mud daubers or the, they call them um, uh, thin-waisted wasps, or I think it's thin-waisted wasps. Um, and they make little chimeneas or little organ type things. And the rumor always is that they kill lots of black widows and things in your landscape. And I don't know how true that is, but it's a good rumor to keep going so that people don't want to hurt them because they're not trying to hurt you in any way. Insects that are solitary. So uh, these have a home, right? And a yellow jacket has a home in the ground. Those that have a house are at their most aggressive when you approach their house or they feel like their home is threatened. So if they're attacking you, you have intruded upon their home in some way and they feel the need to defend it. But insects and stinging insects that have no house that are solitary, they just have these little things that they're laying eggs in, but there's not, you know, multiple um, individuals that utilize that they're not aggressive at all because they have no reason to be, they have no home to defend. And I think I have a big picture, yes, of this cicada killer wasp. These cicada killer wasps look a whole lot like the, um, there's a lot of names for them. The new name is the Northern giant hornet. It was the Asian giant hornet. And then the media likes to call it the murder hornet, which we hate because they're not murdering anything, but honeybees probably, but they um, are not gonna hurt people. Well, there are that, Northern giant hornet is a very large wasp, bigger than even the cicada killer wasp. And you would not believe how many people have killed, how many cicada killers have um, succumbed to people's tennis rackets or, you know, whatever else, because they're trying to kill these, these Northern giant hornets. So if you see these in the summertime, they feed on cicadas. They've been around forever. They're native to the area. Leave them alone. Don't be threatened by them. We're not getting the northern giant hornet in Texas probably ever. It's as far away as it could possibly be in the, the northern part of the state, um, of the country, I'm sorry. Uh, it is like on the Canadian border, and we don't think that they're going to make their way here. They're certainly not going to make that jump from Canada to Texas without us finding them in between along the way and there being a lot more attention about them. And then there's those mud, those cool mud daubers. There's that accordion nest. Um, there's some other neat uh, predators like antlions. If you were a kid and you used to dangle ants and other things over these little kind of inverted volcanoes, these little caverns, then you were playing with antlions inside of usually real sandy soil. Generally, when it's a little drier, if it's a real if it's real wet soil, they don't survive as well because they can't make those dry caverns. But in that little hole is this guy, and these big chompers that you see come out are those big mandibles that they have. They um, make that as a pitfall so they their prey will tumble into it and they can feed on it and this is what the adults look like they look they're actually related to lace wings even though they look a whole lot like a damselfly they're very different from them um, so if you see these usually under trees um, in sandy soil you know what's happening under there and they're I think they're really cool to have have around kind of watch them as we get a little bit more into the summertime, you'll start to know robber flies or start to see them. This is actually a fly, but they will mimic, well, they look like aliens, first of all, but they will mimic 
um, bumblebees, some species will. And these, uh, if you are a honeybee keeper, you probably do not like these because they eat so absolute much and they'll camp out right in front of the entrance of your hive and just pick them off over and over again. I had, um, there's a, there's a bumblebee mimic that likes to feed on bumblebees. And I had a bumblebee mimic that would land on a little fig tree. And I had bumble, I must've had a bumblebee colony real close by this summer, one summer. And because I had a, a, a bush that was flowering and they were there. I mean, I had a puppy, a young puppy that year. So, you know, before the sun came up or as it was coming up, I'm letting the dog out. I was out there with that dog all the time. And this robber fly always had a bumblebee in its hand. So I'm, you know, let things do its thing, but I also really want to keep those bumblebees around. So after a while, I ended up having to knock him down and step on him. But I mean, it was astounding how much food he, they, that robber fly ate. And you know, it's a robber fly because they have these big, huge, gigantic eyes. Their legs are kind of facing forward so they can grab things on the fly. Um, really sunny, arid, drier habitats is what they tend to like. So I'm sure you guys have lots of these guys in El Paso. My favorite, I said lace wings were my favorite, but my other favorite predator are definitely surfid flies. They, they take on a lot of shapes and forms and they can look like a really tiny damselfly or a wasp or maybe a bee mimic. Um, notice though, the eyes, these big giant goggle like eyes, that's how, you know, you're looking at a fly and not something else. And then you, yeah, I think you can see it on all three pictures. There's like this little V in their head. That's their antenna. So their antenna are shorter, kind of more compact. And they look like, you know, you, you put a little V on top of their head. They are very robotic and drone-like in the way that they fly. So they're really zippy, but like very jerky. Um, and if you, this, this is one thing that you can do to bring in beneficials, especially these guys. If you allow your herbs to bolt or flower, they're really highly attracted to those small, small little flowers. So do that. And, and I promise you, you'll bring them in. They'll lay their eggs on plants and their little larvae are super ferocious, really bizarre, really fun to watch feeding on things. That one's being real dramatic with an aphid in its mouth. The adults are predatory, but they're attracted to flowers also. So they're also pollinators. So really, you know, by planting some herbs, cilantro, oregano, basil, a little bit of rosemary, but they really like the tiny, tiny little flowers of those other, um, uh, of those other plants, dill, that kind of thing. Um, you'll, you'll attract a lot of these guys um, it, within no time to your garden. They're probably out already. They're usually the first, first pollinators, first predators, uh, before anyone else kind of wakes up after winter time. And then of course there's spiders. You know, if you find a spider, leave it alone. There's only two harmful spiders medically of medical concern to humans. Uh, everyone else is good. You know, you might be afraid of them just to, just don't look at them, but they're not going to take you down. They're not going to hurt you. Um, about, I don't know, I'd say 99.9 .9 times out of 10, the pictures that I get, is this a poisonous spider? Um, no, actually 0% of them are poisonous. If they're, if they're anything, they're venomous. Um, but most of the time, the pictures that I get sent of spiders in the landscape are not the two harmful ones, which are the widow and the recluse spiders. Those are not going to be out. They don't want to make themselves seen. They're reclusive. They're hidden. They don't want to be real obvious. You have to move something to, to really expose them. And then, so those are predators and uh, parasitoids. Then we've got decomposers. These guys are the things that you think are gross, cockroaches and, and flies, but they have a really important purpose in the landscape and they're part of the ecosystem. And if we didn't have these, we would have a lot of dog poop and um, cow patties and, you know, dead things just sitting around that would take a much longer time to decompose. So yes, they're gross. Um, they kind of are what they eat, but they need to eat these things. They're, they're very vital to the ecosystem. Some of the cuter ones are dung beetles. Uh, they come in when fresh dung is laid. Really, you know, a lot of ranchers really enjoy and, and want to have these around because they help reduce those cow patties. But as soon as um, fresh dung is laid, the mates will come in. Um, they, I don't know if they've mated prior to this or if they mate right there on that cow patty, but the male and the female together will start to roll, will lay an egg and start to roll that dung around it. So they, they cushion it and it's protected inside of this poop ball. And they do this upside down. And you can see she's like doing a handstand right there. And the male is kind of on the other side of her on that picture. 
they do this upside down, they roll it, roll it, roll it, and they roll it back to where they have dug a little hole in the ground. It's maybe about the size largest it would be as a, a nickel, but maybe like a dime. And they tumble it down into that hole where that egg will hatch into a larva, eat the dung, turn into a pupa, use the hardened case of the dung as its case, and then come out as adults to start that process all over again. So, you know, they're, they're turning trash into something usable. They're getting it out of the environment. I mean, they're, they, it's gross to talk about eating dung, but what they do is definitely pretty important. Um, if you are composting or you are getting some mulch or you're digging around in your garden, getting it prepped for the springtime, if you come across big giant grubs, so many times I hear this from gardeners that grubs are bad. Well, I think it's because we think of white grubs in our turf. A grub is just a generic term. It's like calling a kid that is from walking age to not quite great walking age, a toddler. You know, it's just a, a name that we use to describe an immature human. Well, grubs is the name we use to describe the larvae of any beetle. And there are more beetle species than any other insect. So there are lots and lots of species of grubs. So saying something is a grub does not necessarily mean it's a bad guy. The, the white grubs that are in turf can be very harmful to the turf. They are only found in turf. So I have kind of have a think, have a think map. Um, ask yourself a couple questions if you find a grub. Is it in your grass? If the answer is no, don't worry about it. Just stop thinking about it. Don't worry about it. It's a good guy. Is it in your turf? Yes. Well, is it larger than half of an inch? If it is, don't worry about it. White grubs are half an inch or smaller and only found in turf. And then beyond that, you know, does your grass look bad? Okay, maybe we treat for it. If it doesn't, why worry about something that's not hurting it? But these large giant grubs that you'll get in your compost and mulch that are like as big as your hand, those will turn into either, a, 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 we call them rhino beetles, but these two middle picture is the female on top and the male below. They're technically ox beetles, um, or they might be these little Hercules beetles, but they're dynistid beetles, very large beetles that make very big grubs. And they're great to have because they're decomposing. You find them in your soil, plant something there. They are an indicator of environmental soil quality, great, good organic matter, because that's why they're there. They don't feed on roots unless it's decaying. So if they are feeding on roots of something, ask yourself, why is this decaying? They are a symptom. They're not the cause. You also, if you compost, you might come across soldier flies. These are um, really, really cool. They, if you, especially if you're real wet compost, you can hear them kind of squishing around inside there. They like to get into cow manure, um, chicken manure, really wet manure, but they break it down. They're, they're something that you actually want to keep around. The flies are kind of wasp-esque, um, uh, metallic blue and they're not annoying flies. They don't fly around your face like other things do. They really are pretty shy around humans, uh, but they're, they're also a really cool, neat decomposer to keep around. And we actually have people that are farming these soldier flies, taking the waste from restaurants and like the mash from, from um, uh, craft beer places. And instead of sending that food waste into dumpsters and into the landfills, they're utilizing it to feed and grow soldier flies, which can then be fed to our livestock, uh, put into dog food, be fed to chickens. So it's, it's a way to kind of um, reduce the biomass of waste by utilizing some of these really cool beneficial insects. Okay, so probably when you're thinking about good guys, what you're really thinking about are pollinators. So in this last um, 10 or 12 minutes here, we'll talk about, you know, some of the everyone's favorite insect, which are the pollinators. And while there are tons of pollinators out there, you know, we definitely have mammal pollinators and other things, birds that are pollinators. Of the 200,000 species of pollinators, only a thousand are not an insect. Everything else are insects. So we give them the credit because they deserve that credit. We give, there are lots of insects that are pollinators, um, but we really give most of our credit to bees. And that's because they are the best at pollinating. Everyone else does an okay job. Um, some of them do a pretty poor job, but like butterflies and moths, but we still call them pollinators. But the best pollinators are bees. And the reason for that is because they have really fuzzy, fuzzy bodies. So we've got um, native bees and then managed bees. Managed bees are our honeybees. 
I think you could call them native now. They've been around since the 1600s at least, um, but technically they're not native to the Americas um, at all. They were brought over, but we do have some bumblebee species that are native to Texas. We have quite a few. The bumblebees are social, but they will die off in the winter time. Um, oh, I don't have a picture of it. So they'll, they, right now what's happening is queens that have mated in the, prior to the winter, like in the fall, they mated. Then they made it through the winter in a tucked away secluded spot. They wake up, it's getting warm. There are things blooming. They start to come out and they will feed on food, get nice and big and fat again and start to lay eggs and then feed those babies. Those babies will turn into adults. The colony will grow larger and larger. It kind of hits its peak near the end of the summertime. And that, so right now, if you see a bumblebee, chances are you're seeing a queen bumblebee, maybe not the workers, but as the summer progresses, you'll notice more and more of them. Then when fall hits, they start to die off. They produce a whole lot of males who will mate with these new queens who will start that whole process all over again. And their colonies are these little bee pot kind of things, um, little cells and stuff that might be like in the ground in a stump or something like that. Um, but their bumblebees are are more efficient at pollinating certain things like we like, like they're better at pollinating pumpkins and cherries and tomatoes, uh, blueberries, a lot of the foods that, you know, most people enjoy. There's also carpenter bees, which are a little bit different than a bumblebee. Some people don't like them because they will drill a hole um, into wood, especially cedar. We use a lot of that in Texas as kind of an ornamental or a post. And they lay their eggs in those little drilled out spots that they've made. They look different than a bumblebee because they have a shiny hiney. They don't have any hair on their abdomen, um, but they're also really good pollinators. And these guys, as well as bumblebees, will buzz pollinate where they'll just shake super duper fast and they knock the pollen down. So they're, um, you know, they're selfish about their pollen. They want to take this back to their babies and feed them. They don't really want to give it up, but I think it's cool that mother nature has made them buzz pollinate. So that pollen now gets airborne and they're they're pollinating really, really well. And that the, the fact that they sonicate is probably why they're better at pollinating than some honeybees are. Um, there's leaf cutting bees. Leaf cutting bees will cut um, a almost a perfect three quarter circle in a leaf. And then they take that cutting and they line it inside of tubes. This could be the hollow tube of a plant. It could be a screw hole in a piece of equipment you have. It could be um, a, a hose that gets left out. I mean, they generally go after smaller tubes, but it could be that as well. A piece of patio furniture where the top popped off and there's that metal tube. So they will line the inside like insulation and then also use it to put a, a door on it. And they'll lay their eggs inside there. And inside that one tube, they might lay five or six different eggs. And then in between each egg, they have put a little door to you know, protect them. They've also taken a, a pollen ball and given each egg a little bit of food to serve that for that larvae to survive off of until it's ready to emerge in the around now. Around now, they're starting to come out. Mason bees do the same thing. It's really hard to tell species of bees, um, but you always know it's a mason bee because they carry their pollen on their belly. So you can impress your friends if you see those guys around. And they use mud to do the exact same thing. So when you use, uh, native bee homes, you're really attracting species of mason bees and species of leaf cutter bees. And these are what those homes look like. You can purchase them. You can find it on Amazon. You can make them yourself. We'll do this um, in youth camps, or you can just take a, a, you know, a thick piece of wood and drill different sized holes in it. I have found anecdotally, there's no real data on what works best, but I found that the ones that have um, multiple sized holes tend to be utilized more than the, the individual sized holes. But you can take like a soup can or a coffee can and um, we will wrap newspaper around pencils and markers to make different widths, tape it up and then cut them to fit and slide them inside there. And eventually they don't come right away, but eventually they'll start to be utilized by those um, native bees. And what you wanna do is, is probably should have done it maybe in February, kind of, you know, I take a picture of it and when I see that the that the that the sealed up holes from springtime or from, I'm sorry from the end of summer have or I should say probably fall beginning of winter time take a picture the ones that are sealed up 
once I notice that they're open in the spring, then I'll take those tubes out and I'll replace them with clean ones because you don't want to just keep the same thing out over and over again because fungus and viruses will start to build up. And so it can be um, actually pretty detrimental to who you're bringing in. You're actually killing more than maybe you're, you're making. Um, I don't know if you guys have these guys in El Paso yet, but it's probably just a matter of time and soon you will. But if you don't, if you notice up in the tree, a big uh, nest looks like a basketball, a huge football. They're kind of oblong or round shaped. It's uh, probably a Mexican honey wasp and Mexican honey wasps are super common in the valley, really common in San Antonio where I am making their way up north and I'm sure spreading east and west. They are one of the few insects other than honeybees that can produce honey. And I'm sure indigenous people use that honey. We don't because it's really difficult to separate honey from a paper nest. In a, in a beehive, it's waxy. So it's easier to separate and kind of clean that out. The wax sticks together. With, with a paper, it's just a mess. It's not, it's not real easy to separate that stuff out. So you, I don't know that you would find Mexican honey wasp stuff bottled. Um, you'd kill the whole colony also to get to that honey. But it, around um, my area, once you kind of know what these guys look like with their big little butts and they're, you know, kind of um, striped on their abdomen, I notice them all over the place all the time. And I look around and I don't see a nest. So they must forage pretty far. Um, but they're, you know, very good pollinators. In the valley, they're very efficient at being predators of the psyllids that transmit citrus greening. So maybe that's why Florida is having a much harder time than we are in, in, um, in, in Texas, but they're, they are a very, very beneficial insect. So if you end up getting them in, Me in, El, in El Paso, leave them alone because they're good guys and they're not harmful to us. I mean, yeah, they can sting, but you have to really deserve it. You have to earn it to deserve that. We already talked about paper wasps. They they will go after nectar. So they're not feeding on pollen like the other guys that we talked about. Um, and if you're not going after the pollen, then you're not dislodging a lot of it. So they can be okay pollinators, but you notice how they're very naked. So they don't pick up pollen on those hairs and then drop it off on the flowers like our native bees do. Surfid flies are fairly decent pollinators. Um, they are a little bit hairy, especially on their little thorax region. And they are so small, they like to get into that flower. So they're going to dislodge and move it around. So in addition to being those predators, they're really good at pollinating. And if you're wondering what to do, um, this, this is a, a little, I don't know the, where exactly this um, came from, but to give you some ideas who you're trying to attract, the colors that you might want to bring in. And I'll leave this up here for just a second to let you snap a picture of it. Smell wise, they smell things differently than we do, but this was, you know, this would be kind of to your nose, what would be attractive to them. And you notice also on the flower shape, if you want to attract a lot of different pollinators, choose a multitude of colors, but also lots of different types of flower shapes, big bowls for so beetles can cram their way inside there, narrow so that butterflies can put their long proboscis in there. You notice we're not covering butterflies and that's because they're really not that good at pollinating. And we could talk also for an hour and a half just on butterflies. So if you want to attract your native uh, pollinators, your native bees specifically, if you remember nothing else, um, just go after these four colors. Purples, so bees see all wavelengths of light. They don't see reds or pinks all that well. Reds very poorly, in fact. But what they see the best, what they're attracted to the most, are purples, blues, yellows, and whites. And if you really think about it, that's our wildflower colors, you know, that are, that's really most of our wildflowers, except for maybe Indian paintbrushes and things like that. But blue bonnets and, and prairie verbenas and, you know, a lot of the yellow wildflowers that are out there. So if you go to the nursery and you can't, you want to get some pollinating plants, just choose something in these color schemes and most likely you're going to bring and encourage them to stay in your garden. The other things that you can do, think about your pesticide use. You know, I'm, I'm not anti-pesticide, um, uh, but I'm not use it all the time because just because. So think about it if you need to use pesticides. You know, if you have to treat something because it's declining and it's dying, don't apply it when the pollinators are out there. And the best time to apply would be at dusk because that's when all the bees have gone home for bed. Most things have gone to hunker down to go to sleep and they're, you're going to have you know, depending on when it is in the summertime, you're going to have six hours, five hours, who knows, of dark 
before it lightens up again and those pollinators come out. And so that's enough time for that pesticide to now dry up and hopefully not be effective. Don't apply it on the flowers. The other thing I would say is if your plant is flowering, it's probably not in peril. It's not in stress. They generally will flower when they're happy and when they have extra energy and they shut down flowering once the stress kicks in. So, you know, think about that. I do realize that there are plants that flower when they are stressed, but most of our landscape plants are not necessarily that way. Give a little water source if you can, the dirtier, the better for whatever reason they like the minerals and the, um, the nutrients that are in that dirty kind of algae like water plant herbs and let them flower. And then if you have areas where you can let weeds flower, let it, you know, it may not look very pretty, but it's a one way to really bring in a lot of your pollinators. If you are into butterfly gardening, um, I've got a um, uh, online course that's on our AgriLife Learn deal. We didn't cover butterflies, but if you're interested in knowing what's out there in um, ac across Texas, then um, you can do that little QR code or it's agrilifelearn.tamu.edu. And then I think just Google butterflies and it's probably the only thing that's on there. It's like a two hour deal. And we also talk about what flowers to plant, butterfly gardening. And, and we didn't talk about bees um, or honeybees because they're not technically native pollinators, but they are definitely very, very beneficial. And if you um, are thinking about being a beekeeper, I am a beekeeper and, and I put on beekeeping classes. Um, the, that, that, oh yeah, that's a correct flyer, the one on the right. So I've got two different ones. I've got a live version. You can come in person in San Antonio or do it online live. Um, and that's not correct actually on those dates for the online one, but you can do the QR code and it'll get you there or tx.ag uh, forward slash bees. Or you can go on that agrilifelearn.tamu.edu and I have an, it's like a self-paced course that you can also take in addition to that. Um, do you guys, before I move to this next screen, the other things I just wanted to mention is if you um, are into podcasting, we've got a couple podcasts that myself and some colleagues with AgriLife do, Bugs by the Yard, like what's in your yard, what to look out for, and then Unwanted Guests. And we're all located Central Texas or East. So um, you might listen to us a little bit on Bugs by the Yard and get tired of it because we don't really know what's happening over that way. But if you send us comments or bugs to talk about, we'll, we'll make that one of our topics. And I do a lot of webinars and things. So if you want to be added to my email list for upcoming classes or programs, or you don't mind coming to San Antonio, then um, you can uh, do that QR code. It should take you where you just enter your email and I won't bug you with lots of notifications, but you get one like maybe once a week. Most of the time, it's like twice a month. Thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Thank you guys. Yeah.